healing and sale training as a learning environment in youth work. So thank you for this homework, uh, Tomek, but that it gave me so much time and, and material to reflect when while I was preparing this uh, kind of, well, I don't want to say presentation, but it is a presentation. And going through all my uh, long years of work and so on. So, um, so yeah, shortly maybe about myself. I was asking who are you guys, but uh, like who I am here to talk about what I'm going to talk about. So I'm a non-formal education trainer and also project developer with about um, more than 10 years experience and also a sailor. I have sailed 18,000 nautical miles on more than 10 different ships. My favorite uh, ships are Spania, Latila, Helena, and then there are some more. And I also have uh, implemented um, more than 10 different sail training and sailing youth projects. Uh, so, and uh, there is just a list of, of them. Uh, but in general, I'm sailing uh, since 2014 actively. So it's like I was counting, this was my ninth season at sea. And by season at sea, I mean, I really spend um, a lot of time in the sea during summertime. So as you know, in wintertime in, in Latvia, we don't uh, sail, but sometimes we go to some warmer places as well. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and when I am on land, I'm working as a trainer for Latvian National Agency, mostly like everything connected Erasmus Plus projects, uh, working with volunteers, with the municipalities, youth centers, youth workers. So very different, let's say, uh, wide scope of different trainings. and. What is important, I love sea, I love sailing and also non-formal education. So that's why I kind of, this many years ago, more than 10 years ago, I decided I need to put them together because um, there is a, there was, I felt there was a potential and that's something uh, interesting there. But I didn't, uh, I didn't go to some special school or something where I can learn that all my lessons learned are from learning by doing. You cannot study adventure education in Latvia or something like everything is more like practice based. So I had my interesting, um, how to say, uh, experiences, <laughs> uh, ups and downs and different, but I will, I will try to make the story relevant to, to our field and so. So why is not moving? Okay. No, what happened? Oh, something happened with my presentation. It should be here. Yes, it's back. Okay. So, uh, so questions for today, which more or less I promised in description uh, is like, yeah, what can we learn at sea? Also about sustainability, which is more and more relevant topic to different learning mobilities. Uh, also, what can sale training do for young people? And also, in my experience, maybe that that other practices maybe cannot. So what I have seen there and uh, as well, what are advantages and disadvantages to use sale training when working with young people? And also, I know that maybe some of the question of how to become a sailing youth worker or sailing trainer, uh, that also that one probably could be relevant. First, I, I just want to share why I love sea and sail training. So that's my personal opinion. But I know that so many people who are doing the same thing can uh, very much relate. For me, sail training actually and sailing is such uh, it uh, it uh, how to say it it lives with the uh, like basic principle principles of non formal education because this is learning by doing super like we are doing real thing it's very little of simulation more like really doing uh, real stuff and doing in a team learning a lot to be with others and also learning from others and this is a setting where everyone really matters and resonates in a team so we can learn a lot about this you know, intercom like communication between and how it uh, how people um, relate and, and how they impact, uh, which is interesting. It's discipline and freedom on the same time because uh, ships sometimes are very demanding, but on the same time, uh, it gives also a lot of freedom. So kind of a bit contradictory, but, uh, um, but, but that goes uh, quite well together. And what else, the, the biggest feeling what I have is that at sea we are united by force and by force is because we are put on this certain size of the boat and also by nature, like these uh, all elements together. 
and uh, and yeah and and there is no actually space for bullshit because their real actions brings to real consequences so of course uh, one of the topic usually what uh, makes people think of sailing oh what about safety and so on yes this is uh, the most important thing but also that um, there is always this uh, space for learning things and you know when they don't cross the line of the safety and uh, that's why there's always professional crew and then there are certain tasks that people are doing and how they are doing so that this uh, ensure safety but also space for learning and also how to this big mechanism what happens on the ship so yeah and for myself i think that's the best place um, where to meet your real self uh, i think the biggest ups and biggest downs i have experienced uh, on the ships and sailing or related to that because somehow the volume of um, events emotions on the ship goes up you know like on a land there are more how to say you need more much bigger events to get the same emotions as uh, when you are in the sea and that's amazing place to discover your limits and also push your limits because on land it's not always so easy to actually explore and to see and and the sea was the sea is a good place where you much easier can uh, how to say maybe reach your limits you see okay that's it that's my limit and but on the same time you can really discover things that you can do and you could never ever imagine that you it was even possible so yeah so that's all about um, yeah learning to be and the best thing is that um, as i said before there's no space for bullshit because salty water washes your social makeup and also physical makeup all the makeups away in some very short time and then and then there you are like just as you are and then you can really start working with yourself and there is not this you know oh we did a nice session we did a nice simulation we did not build this thing or it didn't work out but it doesn't matter because now we have a coffee break we go there and we forget because in real life we are amazing team workers and we always succeed but uh, but this is not how it works on a ship because this is we just have it what we have now and we have to deal with it this is, so it's more real and it's more like uh, immediate so and yes and after all these nine years in the sea doing different projects um, yes sometimes it is hard and from logistics i would say sail training sailing projects are one of the most complicated projects to implement because there are so many elements you need to think about and also there are so many elements you cannot impact you cannot order specific weather you know you sometimes you go to marinas where there are no facilities and 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 or something is changing but still i can say it is still rewarding because the, this realness what you can get out of it and and all these processes, what happens on the ship, I think they are very deep uh, and, uh, and also with different outcomes that resonate, not just after this one week or few days, but actually in years. And this is what I can see now as well, uh, seeing the people around, also people in, in our team, how they are actually changing through the years and how they are choosing different paths just because they somehow join the sailing community and so on. Um, I think I should do some research on that to prove it actually, not just saying my observations. <laughs> that would be. Okay, so that's about um, what I see there, what I have observed. Um, but um, yeah, continuing this one, um, I, I just wanted to bring up some myths and truths about sailing. Uh, the most famous is that you need to own a ship and to be a millionaire if you want to say. So that one is because that's why this is something where people don't even try to find some opportunities, just keep dreaming, oh, maybe one day, day I would sail and so on. Uh, which um, is partly true. If you want to own a ship, you better are a millionaire because the ship really requires a lot of care. But if you want to just sail, you don't need the ship, you don't need so much money. 
And there are so many different uh, programs where people can join for a shorter period of time. They can join um, uh, as a member uh, of the team. There are scholarship funds, there are projects. So there are many possibilities. And actually, I would say uh, this is not that expensive. And maybe sometimes I'm, I'm sailing because it's cheaper than do something else. <laughs> and it's just a matter of, uh, of some time you can invest and, 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 and the communities you, uh, you are in. Also, another thing is people think that sailing is mostly about learning technical skills, which can be true if you are focusing on that. And then, uh, of course, there are some technical skills you need to learn uh, in order to be kind of useful for the team. But at the same time, I would say that's just the very surface level of what sailing is about and also really depends on uh, what kind of program you are joining. Because for me and also some other ships I have sailed on, for example, this one, what you can see in a picture, it's so much about soft skills, so much about learning about yourself, so much about much, much more than just to know which sail is what. And of course, uh, if you are joining some maybe uh, racing team, it will be a lot about uh, technical stuff and being quick and doing things. But uh, most of the projects, what I'm talking about, it's not about racing, it's not about, not about competition and performance. It's really about uh, being together, living together, sharing in community, belonging, supporting each other and and also on top of that, going from places and enjoying the nature and the sea. Uh, one more thing what people are afraid of is being seasick. And that's a real thing that happens. And, um, but if you are even seasick and some people get seasick for several days and sometimes they are just um, like what I'm doing here and, and what's, what's happening and, and I, shouldn't, I, should, I just should go home. But I have seen people who are seasick for three days and we got super worried because, you know, at some point your body just, uh, you know, you cannot do this. You, you cannot eat, you cannot drink and, and you, yeah, you start to need, you need to start to use this special medication so your body gets, uh, it doesn't get dehydrated. But also I have seen these people who have been seasick for three days, even they afterwards became skippers and, uh, and sail a lot. So it really depends because it's super personal if you get seasick and, or not. Mm -hmm. And also like every sailor once in a while gets seasick. Some are like, some some has it stronger, some has it less, but, but that's just a part of that. And there are different tips and also different medicine how you can actually kind of deal with this. And and then, um, but it doesn't mean that you cannot sail and you shouldn't just, and, and most of the sailors also, when they start the season, they get seasick and, and then, then it goes away in, uh, in hours or in days. And, and that's, so that shouldn't be some obstacle. And we usually show what to do, how to do, give some tips if you are seasick, then, uh, because that will, that may pass away. Yes, and one more that the sailing is some non-stop non party on a ship. If you look in the movies, you know, you are sitting with the cocktails and so on and so and take an Instagram selfie. So this selfie, I'm almost selfie in the picture, in a, you can see this is from the ship. But, um, but yeah, so you have duties, you have some obligations, so you have, um, so it's not about just being a passenger, it's about being a crew, having your own. Uh, specific task to do according to your experiences and, and so. And yes, and uh, you do not need to have a very strong sailing skills or sailor certificates if you want to sail. Of course, if you want to become a watch leader, which is like captains, uh, captains, helpers and uh, or deckhand or some professional, then of course you need to have good skills and certificates, but most of the different programs is also for anyone who just wants to try out sailing. Yes, so this is about uh, myths and truths. Um, what is, um, yeah, maybe you have some still that you think about sailing. What do you think guys about sailing? What is that all about? Once, maybe you wanna check if that's true or not. I have a myth, which maybe it's not, or a fear, which it's dangerous. 
you can die. So the sailing is dangerous. Mm. Yeah. Um, I would say it is uh, um, yes and no, I think. Of course, sailing may be dangerous if you are not aware and if you are not prepared, if you, if you sail with someone who is not uh, qualified and experienced in the sea, because sea as itself, it's, I think it's dangerous. You need to follow weather forecasts. You need to, to have all the safety equipment and everything. But in general, like to be honest, I feel more safe, for example, on a sailing boat where we are sailing with other people than, for example, on a big ferry, uh, just going as a passenger, because um, I know much more where is this all safety equipment. I know all my team members by name. I know them by skills. I know there is not going to be a huge panic in a crowd of thousands. I know that there is a radio for communications and that's why all these um, international safety standards are in place and procedures, how you communicate. And also that all the technologies have developed much more nowadays. And of course it involves some risks, but, um, but mostly I would say, I would say it's, um, first of all, it's much, much safer than when, you know, Columbus was <laughs> discovering new continents for sure. And people were, you know, uh, not returning home and so, but, uh, and uh, all this equipment, what, has developed and also regarding to the clothes as well there are so much uh, different um, uh, different uh, very good you can feel super comfortable on that so so yes but don't do it just by yourself do it with a crew that you trust and of course accidents sometimes happen but always they yeah they are followed or analyzed and so on so but i would say most of the accidents i would say happen with, with people who are not really fully aware of what they are doing. And this is super important because it is not enough to pass keeper's license, you know, like, oh, I have a driving license, no, I can go. I would say the biggest teacher is the C and she doesn't, you know, check your papers. <laughs> she checks your knowledge and doesn't matter. And, and so, and that's why also it's super strict that, that uh, there is zero alcohol toler tolerance in the sea and so on. So, and uh, wearing the life vests, everything. So we, there are instructions, what to do in certain situation if someone gets on overboard. So all these kind of um, security. Um, yeah, so safety first, that's a very, very important thing. That's the first instruction actually you get when you get on the, uh, on the ship. So yeah, but of course people are, some people are afraid of sea in general. Some people are more adventurous and so on. So I'm not saying that now no accidents happen ever. It is with higher risks than just to, you know, go for a walk. That's for sure. Okay, let's see what else do I have there. So uh, yes, uh, next I want just to shortly um, in, uh, introduce you with the Sail Training Association Latvia, the organization uh, which has been my kind of home and community for all these years. And thanks to that, I have uh, had a chance to develop all these projects um, and, and how we are doing and what we are doing. And through this organization, I believe you can also get an image of, um, of how in general, who are these uh, sail training organizations, because uh, this is how most of them operate with maybe some a little bit, little differences. So yeah, so we are dedicated to sail training. And in a picture, you can see our lovely ship um, or sailing yacht called Spaniel. By the way, it's Polish one. It was she was built in Poland um, and uh, oh yeah I have even uh, some facts about the yacht um, so she's 17 meters just to imagine how how does it look like so she is in the picture so 17 meters long she was built in Poland and especially it's a unique design and she was built um, and uh, for crossing Atlantic Ocean like solo like just one person on board she did it and she won that year. So she was even uh, in the Guinness record book as the fastest monohull yacht in that uh, time uh, who, who did this cross crossing in, yeah, you see uh, less than 20 days. And, uh, but during, uh, yeah, so she was built in Poland and, but during Soviet Union, she ended up in Latvia. And then there was um, this, uh, 
very great guy, Gunnar Steinitz, our, our, our captain and owner of the boat, who decided one day that she really, he really wants that sailing is developed in Latvia and, and, and kind of started to, started to promote sail training. And basically a huge, huge community with hundreds of people who are sailing is ground just because of this one boat. I would say at least three different sailing generations um, are grown in Latvia because of, of this, because he made it available for everyone in a very democratic way. And since, to the, since 1998, she's every year participating, except during COVID, uh, she's participating in tall ship races. So she's never in the summertime, she's usually not in Latvia, she's sailing all around the Europe and also have sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, not only in, in, in this uh, 80, but also before. So she's super active and international. So basically, without any specific youth mobility programs, she's doing her job by herself just because people are coming together and, and wants to sail. And uh, yes, and so you can see, for example, uh, last year, this year, ship races, this uh, huge regatta where sail training vessels come together, usually like 60, 80, this year was about 40 because after COVID it was a bit less active. So these are the um, uh, where we are sailing, it depends really on the year. So it's super international kind of, uh, it's, it's a race, it's a regatta, we are competing with other ships, but the most important point is that uh, it's not about racing, it's about sail training, it's about intercultural learning, because when we are on the coast, we meet other ships, other people, so it's kind of a huge, uh, huge movement since, uh, since 90s, um, and different countries uh, and, and, and port uh, cities host this event. But uh, getting back to Spaniel, so yeah, I would say we have uh, cost uh, trained um, like many, many, many sailors, and usually you have 60 to 80 active team members uh, who are sailing every year, and all the year is divided in little gaps and, and so on. And uh, yes, and just to get getting a bit back oh, of this um, uh, about the mission page. So yeah, in general, uh, to participate in tow ship races, one of the rule is you need to have a half of the crew needs to be under 25. And uh, old people cannot sail alone, so they need to take young people with them. And so this was kind of a bit forced, forced way how we became uh, very focused on the youth uh, as a group. But since I joined the organization, we have then done also kind of many changes that um, that this is actually the core of of organization and all what's written in our mission is not just fuzzy words, but actually that's what we are doing with this, because through this practical uh, sailing and and going on a trips, organizing trips, experiencing and learning, uh, young people become much more, um, uh, what let's say, with skills. For life because we are yeah we are organizing our life we are living on this boat and and it's fully uh, yeah living in a community and we develop leadership skills sense of belonging this one is actually one of the strongest i would say thinking of different communities we belong and or we may belong the sailing community even the international one is quite strong i would say and people are really making friendships across different ships and 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 yeah, and feeling that they belong, and of course all the different not only sailing skills but also different uh, life skills in general. What they do, uh, some people, some young people in some projects, they they cook for the first time, but they do it on the on the ship and so on. So it's like uh, very also practical. Um, uh, practical life skills, um, but and of course this uh, living together and 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 saving resources because when we are on the ship we don't have much. In in that sense, we need to really think of everything what we are taking with us. Okay, so um, yeah, and then um, we also have two more um, two more ships, uh, but it's maybe not that important. What I want to say visually how uh, how the organization looked like one year after I joined organization. So there were these active members, 
uh, who have uh, this uh, information list, some uh, 10 to 15 skippers, I mean the, the captains who can actually organize trips and sail training and board members. And then I started, and then the few projects started. And now in 2022, we have already three different ships. Uh, the number of active members is not increasing because they are also changing and the COVID did some, some job. Uh, but we are more active and we have uh, a quite a list of different projects and we have a special watch leader program where we are preparing uh, people to be sail trainers and we have our own skippers course when after what you can take an exam and become a captain so has things have been developing yes but now about um, about the uh, sail training and sail training approach so how do we do it and uh, and and yeah and so what are these elements more from a methodological let's say perspective uh yes first what we it is important for us that sailing is dem sailing is democratic so it's available for everyone we accept anyone who wants to sail different ages uh, we don't say only young it's not for only young people but specifically for young people there are less barriers to to join the team so since we are by our own maintaining our boat there is certain membership fee but since we are many because in some in some sailing teams there are only few people each of them pay quite a lot of money and that's all it's closed circle it's just for them it's uh, exclusive and so uh, for us it's uh, very democratic so it's like anyone can join it doesn't matter your age your your nationality most of the time we we sail in latvian but now more and more also internationally in uh, in english uh, everything is learning by doing so we practice on the yachts also in preparing in the spring when we before we put the yacht into the water it's a lot of uh, common work so it's kind of work therapy a bit but also it's saving we are saving costs and also the young people who just joined the team they can see how these boats actually look like from inside from old elements that they feel that okay i have also helped i'm not just a client or passenger coming and sailing but also have been involved and we can always find works for everyone so it's really like common um, a common preparation so that's one important part so that every member spends certain amount of hours for preparation uh, and then since i am in the team we are bringing more and more non-formal education methods on board especially in youth sale training projects but uh, also in project and, and in projects uh, with the young people, some adventure trips, and but also I can I see through these years how more and more captains are adapting some of the methods because before when I joined it was more I would say yeah it was more about practical sailing and so on but 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 since um, now we have develop certain community with common values and approaches that we really want to have more focus on briefing of different training processes and more um, yeah so more aware then and also we have more like learning materials adapted and so that's that's more aware learning process as such and yeah we also have sea buddies approach so anyone who wants to join doesn't feel alone we have some older more experienced uh, sailor uh, like how to say assigned that they can more um, yeah get them more integrated in the team and yeah and then we have very long uh, years traditions with um, with the spring works which i already mentioned before the season starts also for yacht, pre yacht preparation to take her out and so also because the season starts in May and ends on in uh, mid October and then we have also closing event we give awards as well in a team uh, we give some uh, some awards for the, the like the how to say most progressed uh, the new like not more how to say yeah, the most active new member, uh, the captain who did the most training. So we also do some inner award ceremony to motivate people uh, to get involved more, to grow more, to become more active and so on. So that's also part of um, uh, part of our inner 
culture. And uh, yes, and um, what else we do with young people? One of the, how to say, legendary event is uh, what we do with every year. So basically, uh, when I started, to, when I joined the team of, uh, of SDA Latvia, there was always a shortage of young people. They always said it's so, so hard to get enough young people to sail, to fulfill all these places for international trips and so on. And then in 2017, we started this uh, uh, kind of annual event, which lasted through every time it lasts through the three days uh, where we do give a chance to try out sailing for anyone from Riga. So yeah, it's, re it's for young people from Riga because it is financed by Riga Council. And so basically in three days, 100 young people try out one of the, one of the five yachts. And usually the, the event lasts for a day. And so they get the first uh, taste of sailing. We start the morning with some non-formal education methods on the coast all together, uh, finding out uh, what, is, uh, what is going to happen this day and so on. Then we have practical sailing. And then at the end, we have some uh, sharing of um, how the day went and so, and as well, some crazy sail sailing stories from maybe ocean and so on. Uh, and, and of course, uh, important information, how to, yeah, how to get into sailing if they're interested. And now after six years, we have another problem. Uh, we don't have enough crew to train these young people because every year so many young people join the team and get into the sailing. And now we are trying to, uh, to solve another problem, which I will, tell you, I will tell a bit later about what we do with this. But yeah, in general, in this, we have done uh, several projects, um, uh, also with Erasmus Plus and um, working with uh, sailors, with youth workers, with young people, depending on the certain situation what was relevant in that moment yes i don't know do, do you have any questions for now because uh, maybe i'm telling you something that is not even relevant <laughs> it's always so hard to be <laughs> to talk all the time or is okay now <laughs> for now <laughs> oh no too much okay no answer <laughs> For me, I don't have questions so far because okay. it's related I mean. to the organization. So uh, the previous part, personally to me, helped me to know your organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just please react somehow or write even in chat because it's hard without this immediate feedback. Okay, now I will start my personal story and so how it all started. And this started actually in 2012. Uh, when uh, I was young and crazy and brave enough to decide that the best way how to learn sailing is to organize youth exchange about sailing on sailing boats. So uh, disclaimer, please don't try. <laughs> it's not the best way how to do it. But it happened, we did, we got the grant, we wrote amazing project, we invited five different countries, uh, 20 young people from, yeah. And uh, the plan was to sail, as you see in these uh, uh, red, um, red lines, yeah, in a Baltic, bay, uh, Baltic Sea in the Riga Bay. In reality, we got only this one line up until this place, the uh, Ainashi. So, um, so um, this, um, I really like the project, to be honest, but I was not, uh, maybe I was the only one <laughs> because, um, so the lesson learned from this was, um, um, was that um, how important it is to prepare people for uh, sailing adventures, uh, explain them or even scare them with crazy stories of things that may happen and so on, because it was a very interesting experience that, People from Spain, from Greece, they said they are super afraid of Baltic Sea because it's not green and blue, it's dark. And uh, even if we were sailing a little bit on the coastline, people were really kind of not feeling comfortable. They said they don't like this project. And when we were asking why they don't like it, they said 
because we are living on the boat and we are sailing and we are moving around. So basically that was my first lesson that super, super important is to prepare people and really to make sure they are ready of what is this for. Because the, the, the project was, the idea was to promote non-formal education in the coastal area especially rural areas. And we go around with two sea catamarans, like the big ones, you can, can host like 12, 16 people. And we would live there, we, we would sleep there, we would sail with them, that would be our base. And, and then we organize some workshops on the coast. They really liked the workshops and everything what happened on the coast, but they were really not comfortable with the sea. And, uh, and yeah, so, it was really like half of the group even decided at the end to go back to Riga by bus, saying that they're not gonna, gonna sail, they don't feel that it's for them. And this was for me really kind of surprising because uh, I really got to know sailing in general. And um, okay, I'm now I'm saying it wasn't all the group, just <laughs> like part of the group were inter uh, interested and excited. But that was um, um, that was the number was big enough to start thinking of uh, so what did we do wrong, and what actually was happening in this project. And one of these conclusions was that preparation is super important key. And one more thing what happened, we got stuck in one marina because some bad weather came. So the plan to go further to the one more stop was we had to cancel it. And this is one of the things what sailing um, uh, is about, to be flexible, to adapt, to accept um, what you cannot impact and, uh, and, and be ready for uh, plan B and C and D sometimes. Because when you apply the project, of course, you have a nice plan how the things will go. But then uh, you need to think through of um, what if and then lots of what ifs. And, and in our case, yeah, the last stop we couldn't, uh, like the first day was amazing. Everyone loved that. Um, because there was zero wind, so we didn't sail, we were just engineering, so basically it was not even sailing, we were just moving because there was flat sea and everything. And, uh, and the second day when we actually started to sail, then people said no, but it's moving and, and it's not that comfortable and so on. And also one thing what we did, we started to sail because uh, we did first part of project on a coast in a youth center, and then we moved to the um, uh, to these catamarans and started to sail, which I think it was another one. We need to give time for people to get used to this environment before we actually go into the sea, just to get used to to spend one day, one evening when it's still on the coast uh, to learn how everything functions and so on. So I think to just get on and go, it's um, it's a bit also huge, uh, huge jump and so. So yeah, so basically um, on one hand, I, we could say that it wasn't, and yeah, and in this picture, you can see my dear colleagues uh, in red and yellow and super raining day when we had to move and everyone was unhappy because it's raining, it's wet, we need to get out. Then we got stuck in that marina. And yeah, and this was amazing moment when I met these girls, I'm still working with them because when I saw how they are dealing, how we are dealing together with all these situations and unplanned uh, circumstances because, because these participants didn't want to, uh, you know, spend much time on the boat and sailing and so on, we had to arrange like in one day a place on land where we could do that. So we organized that we will continue doing activities in local school. So basically we made plan B, we organized youth exchange on land, partly just in a, just on a spot. <laughs> like tomorrow we, we go there, we do this, and then they were kind of happy. They preferred to sleep in the school on the floor than all together in one room, then then share like in the, yeah, in rooms in a, in a, in a, in a, in a boat. So yes, but, so this of course was a bit um, kind of uh, stressful times, but on the same hand, uh, on the same, uh, on the same time, it was also uh, a lot of things to reflect on. So what did we do or what we didn't do? And what could be done? And this, I don't know why and how, maybe my passion for sea was so big that instead of sitting and crying how bad I am in uh, organizing youth exchanges, uh, 
I was sitting and thinking, okay, so I made a lot of notes for myself. Okay, this maybe should be done this way or, oh, there is this potential uh, way to develop something else. So basically I collected all the lessons from this and decided um, that yes, there is potential, but probably if I wanna do this in future and I knew I want to do this in future, then maybe first I need to do a homework and learn to sail by myself, like really properly, fully understand everything what's happening on the ship. And believe me, that was a very, very good idea. <laughs> so I invite you to start from this part, not from the previous, because if you do like I did, you will see the ship as totally disturbing element for your learning program. Like, but if you make friends with sailing, with the ship, with all the what ship can actually offer, then you will see some hidden treasures, what you can use in learning process that actually you cannot see if you don't know all of that. So it's really a huge difference how much you are into this sailing as such. And I have seen these stories from many trainers. They say, yeah, I, I remember from, uh, from the meeting in Bonn, our colleagues said we were making this round of what was the worst uh, the worst uh, training environment you did something and one person said that was a ship and for me yeah I can understand why but on the same time I think there is something also that uh, very stable very big wide training room cannot actually offer so yeah so there I would say I started sail from this part and from this point Okay, and now let's get a bit on the ships. I will tell you a bit in details how, um, how the life on ship looks like. What are the kind of framework we need to see and fit? Um, first of all, to operate the ship and then to think, okay, what is there for learning, for seeing uh, all these things? And uh, most of the ships, um, but now, now I'm speaking about like, let's say long sailing trips. Most of the ships operate in uh, three watches. So basically that means there are different shifts that people are assigned to. And there is always uh, someone who is more experienced, is its keeper, watch leader, deckhand, watch officer, depends on the ships. For example, on Spaniel, the day when we go, we go for really long trips, usually for three, five days, maybe seven days without seeing the coast. But that's like a, that's not, now I'm not talking about this different projects, but like a normal sailing trip. And it's usually rotating watches, and uh, so it's three or four hours you need to be on deck you need to steer you need to trim the sails you need to watch out if everything is safe and so on and then you do rest of um, of uh, um, six or eight hours depending on the watch and then it's rotating so we really like this rotating approach because uh, of three hours because then it's not fixed in short trip, you can experience everything. You can experience sunrise, sunset, uh, night. I, sorry, I will mute you because I think there are some sounds coming. <laughs> so like very different times of the day, different dynamics and different, um, uh, different weather as well. Uh, yes, so that is the most popular one. So I'm basically, yeah, and uh, after you are done with your deck watch, then you go to cook, to clean, to rest, to, to sleep, depends on what you want. Uh, what is important is in this system, that means that you sometimes, not sometimes, but actually, yes, uh, you need to wake up in the middle of night. For example, you it might happen that your watch starts at three o'clock in the night or six o'clock in the morning. So it really depends on, uh, on, uh, on which watch you are and, and which day it is. So that's um, a lot about discipline and timing is super, super important because if you're not on time, that means the previous watch has to work longer and they are also very tired. So it's super important to kind of divide and be disciplined and, uh, and be on time. And then, so that was about Spaniel, about the boat I, I started sail on. And now about the bigger ships have a bit more complicated watch schedules. For example, on Attila, where I sometimes work as coach on board, meaning I'm the person who is basically trainer facilitator, 
who is like kind of additional program to uh, sail training, but more like speaking about uh, basically leading different workshops on soft skills, personal development, discussions, getting to know each other, taking care of group dynamics and all these things. And there they have a bit different watch system. They have one watch officer, uh, then they have four watch leaders. They also have their own rotations. And then there is a group of uh, participants. And, and for them, it works as well. Either it's three watches for four hours or four watches of three hours. And they also are rotating. But on top of that, and yeah, and comparing to Spaniel, where we don't have cook on board, we are also cooking for ourselves. Uh, then Attila has this uh, unique opportunity that we don't need to cook. In, in general, there are 24 people on board, including the professional crew, and, and one of them is cook. So basically, uh, if participants need to help in kitchen, which is galley on the ship, it's called galley, uh, then, um, then they are just helping to to kind of give the food or wash the dishes but not really cooking itself and then they also have this amazing concept of happy hour and happy hour doesn't mean that you are getting cocktails or something like that happy hour means that all together we are cleaning the ship and if you are sailing a wooden ship this is super super important because the wood needs a special care but if all the crew is cleaning together and not just one or two people are assigned, then that means the happy hour is not even lasting for one hour. It's just half an hour and everything is done. So usually it is scheduled on a ship's whiteboard where all the information is. And then, uh, and then this, um, this, is, um, this is what happens. And then, yeah, everyone goes to do that. And the just watch officers are staying uh, for uh, keeping the sailing. And yeah, in coaching sessions, these are the ones I mentioned about different activities uh, uh, that we are doing as a group. Uh, um, yeah, there's certain time, uh, one or two hours per day that there is this group meeting doing some stuff together. So I would say Attila is one of the very, very few ships, I guess uh, only one I know, who actually has such position as coach on board or trainer on board who is taking care because of this the more soft skills and personal development uh, stuff. So, um, so because they have this specific program and uh, they are working on that. But the coach, um, to be a coach on such a ship is not a very easy job because you also need to work with the crew and, and crew, which are watch officers and watch leaders in total about eight people. They're also coming to the ship. Uh, watch leaders are volunteers. Crew is um, working there. And uh, they are also coming from very international backgrounds. They are staying for weeks or sometimes months. And you also need to give kind of support and, and work with them. But also their days are quite busy. The schedule is super busy. And so, and then there is one more uh, watch system where our kind of the life on the ship is divided in two there is deck watch and the standby watch which is more below the deck so basically and this is on helena on on a finished ship and then you just need to know which watch you are one two three or four and then looking at the schedule looking at the time and the date you know what what do you need to do so there is certain list of the tasks and and being on deck meaning means sailing duties steering trimming the sails and so on and navigating um, and below the deck means you need to cook because the helena again it the crew is uh, 28 people and they don't have a cook on board so it's like a cooking for quite a lot of people but uh, at least there is some uh, mentor or gasty who is coordinating all the process so it's part of the sail training so yeah cooking is part of the sail training so yes, and now it's like a little overview of what we did um, actually in um, previous um, Erasmus Plus sport pro uh, project called Watch Leaders for Better Sail Training. I'll tell you a bit more in a, in a moment what else we did, but one of the things that we were comparing uh, different ships with different systems and seeing how, how do they uh, collaborate. So watch leaders are the ones who are helping captain in actually working with people who want to sail with young people on board and so on. 
So yes, I don't know if uh, you are interested in this, but um, but yeah, just to comparing, there's different there are different ships with cook on board, without. Then also the number of uh, professional crew depends on the ship specific. Attila is wooden ship, Helena is metal ship, Vahina and Spaniel they are um, boats, um, so um, fiberglass boats. So it's really uh, like um, depends um, also on the rigging because, for example, Vahina has more sails than Spaniel because Spaniel is sloop. So like different, I will show you in, uh, in some pictures. So actually what I'm trying to tell you that actually what is possible on certain ship is also depends on, uh, on the rigging, on how the ship is built, how she looks like. And, and also how many people, how many hands do you, do you need for, uh, for operating? And because the, some of them are more simple to do, and some of them are more complicated, like Attila has nine sails and 60 different ropes that you need to learn and know what to pull, how to pull and so on. And Spaniel has two sails, well, three sails, but on the same time, well, the Spaniel has more sails, but uh, on the same time, uh, you are using two sails. So basically, it's really, uh, it really depends on, uh, on how much you need to learn about the ship. Yes, maybe you have something more to ask about life on a ship or some specific uh, things. Because yeah, now what I'm explaining, I was explaining about these uh, long passages when you really go from one country to another and how the things are organized there. And uh, now I will tell more about um, the projects we did with sail training, which are a bit different than uh, the normal passage, I would say. Yeah, it will be also interesting to know what do you do beside this tech responsibility. It mm -hmm. seems there is plenty of time, but I'm sure it's also full of different activities, reflections, I don't know, different mm -hmm. mo learning moments. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so as I said, that on Attila, uh, for example, um, okay, maybe I will tell you about the project and then I will say what is different, what is usually and what is not usually, so that would uh, maybe be good to compare. Okay, so about sail training projects. Um, the one I already explained you, the one I felt like, okay, we did not succeed, but which was kind of a good base to go through and work on, uh, on stuff. And the first project was uh, what we did in 2015 was sail for entrepreneurship. And, uh, and what we did beside that, uh, we traveled all the road. You can see we did actually visit four different countries, which after, in Erasmus Plus program was not allowed anymore. We used to stay in one country and be there and base there, but then it was not written like that. And so we actually sailed. Well, we understood also that maybe we sailed a bit too long because it was two weeks in total. For now, it seems to do a project for two weeks, who has time for that, you know, it's quite a lot. Um, but sailing is a slow process in general. So this was the route. But what we did in this project, so first, uh, so since this was first international project with Latvians and Estonians, we, uh, uh, and we were like, okay, we speak English, all of us, better or less, but, and we sail, so everything should be fine, right? And then we arrived, and then we realized that even we speak English, and we know sailing, we cannot sail in English, because we actually don't do it. We did not know, we didn't even have a vocabulary for sailing because uh, that's not what we used to do like normally. So what we did, we made a visual vocabulary. We spent a lot of time to actually clarify all the terms and being on and learn the same language to sail. So we did it more in, a, in some internet, in interactive workshops as well and also exchanging different, uh, uh, yeah, some of them were more sailors, uh, experienced sailors, some of them were less, but that's what we, we made this kind of visual um, interactive um, uh, vocabulary. And uh, yeah, so what else we did? Um, so basically this project was about developing entrepreneurship um, uh, competence. Uh, so uh, what we were doing, we did some simulations on 
how it is to develop a business plan. So people were kind of working in groups, thinking of, so then as well, we were, um, uh, yeah, so they developed some ideas. Then we went to Gotland, which is Swedish island. And uh, they were uh, they were doing some uh, kind of, uh, they, they created some prototypes, they uh, worked out, uh, they tested in local market. So it was kind of a simulation of how does it work when you go on, on another country and to try to understand the local market, the local needs and so on. So of course we had a lot of uh, different also theoretical background lectures and so, but, but also some practical. And, uh, and what else was uh, in this project? So yeah, actually many people, um, so we, we, what we tried to do, it was the balance between sailing and also some content work and workshop because sailing is a very great uh, environment and regarding the profession, uh, personal development and, and so, but you really need to make space and time for, uh, for uh, discussions, for, uh, for the briefing of different processes, for teamwork and so on. Otherwise, it will disappear. You know, it will stay on this technical surface level. And this is something what we really try to integrate. Um, a lesson learned from this project was, yeah, don't do it for two weeks. It's too long. It's people can, can lose focus. Uh, but also that um, at uh, for even if we do this on sailing vessels and we do sail. Uh, maybe the sailing part, like the distances shouldn't be so long. So we actually ended up with um, some proportion uh, that uh, half or one third actual sailing, when you fully focus on sailing and, 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 and so on, is maybe the best way for such kind of when you want also to put some content. Because when, when we are in the sea, there are some moments when... Uh, um, you cannot consume a lot of like, you know, content information and so on. It's a lot to, you know, it's a good place where give uh, to take about uh, to think about some deep stuff and, and, uh, and, and, and so on. But, but sometimes it's maybe it's not, um, it's not the best way where to consume a lot of information, let's say, because it's already quite challenging. So that was our one of, but what, uh, what happened next at the end, we really made amazing uh, uh, photo exhibition. Uh, all the teams worked together to make, and they traveled all the Baltic states and with some uh, events. So basically that was one of the kind of outcomes and, and practical, uh, practical things what, uh, what people did. So what else we did, we had a talent show and one on one of the islands people who were together for one week already, they discovered that they don't know actually about much about these people. They were sharing all the, uh, the boat all the time with. So yeah, there were many these kind of um, elements. So, and the, the interesting thing is that actually some of, most of these people, yeah, most of, uh, at least two or three people actually, um, got involved more in commercially in sailing. So I know that one girl with her husband, now she's traveling around uh, on a sailing boat and also the, the skipper of this trip got a job offer because of this project. So basically people even started to develop some professional uh, professional uh, uh, career out of, uh, out of this experience, which was very interesting. So in, in very much in line with entrepreneurship topic. So that was about um, the first one. So we took our lessons and the second project was um, Sail for Youth and where we actually wanted to yeah, collect all this uh, kind of knowledge, most or less what I'm sharing you now. And also we developed guidelines for um, how to, yeah, what to do and how to do on the ship. So basically, um, there's just some screenshots of the guidelines, how they look like. I couldn't find them anymore in Salto database. I don't know because uh, <laughs> that was uploaded there and now it's disappearing. Maybe I should do it again. So basically this little book, which was done by all these amazing people together uh, is more explaining also some theor theory of experiential learning, of, uh, of outdoor education, some basic stuff, giving some methods because they were also, we were sailing as well, of course, um, but we 
as you can see in the program draft, we sailed these blue parts. So we actually sailed quite little, but we were living on these boats. And uh, what we did, we learned more about non-formal education. We learned about um, uh, how to organize, yeah, how different systems work in different countries. Uh, so basically, this was kind of first tryout to start to do kind of um, sailing youth worker movement in a sense because we sailed, but also we wanted to learn, like we wanted to kind of uh, make make this even that some people were coming from non-formal education backgrounds, some were coming more from sailing, and we wanted to make it even that they are fully known about sailing and as well of non-formal education. So we did a little uh, circle in um, in, uh, in Riga Bay, we visited Estonia, but mostly in Latvia we were. And also, yeah, and a part of this was also practice with the young people uh, in two different uh, like port cities, uh, marina cities and uh, with the local young people. So basically they developed a few hours program. That was something that they were preparing. They were integrating all different non-formal educations and they were practicing with young people. And also local television came. Uh, we, um, uh, they filmed some very nice video and put on the news that we were doing this crazy project. And the funny thing was that we had a real uh, team building, as you can see in that picture. Uh, these people standing in line with the with the with the rope. They were not just having fun or making some uh, exercise. They were actually trying to get. They were actually helping to get the boat off the how you call sh no, shallow place. So because it was like the water level was exactly as it should be and then there were some uh, sands that then basically now they are pulling the boat away so it was a real teamwork without any exercise that we started that morning because even we have sea maps and all these um, you know detailed um, how deep is where there are some cases when the water level in general are going a bit higher or lower and this was the case when uh, Everything was fine day before and the next day they got a bit stuck <laughs> and uh, now we are pulling them. So yeah, these kind of things also sometimes happen, but uh, there was done nothing to worry about, no rocks, no, no damage was done, just a little morning exercise for team building. And this is something really interesting about this Sell for Youth project that um, I don't know how did I organize that, but uh, even the weather was helping me to build up the program accordingly. It, the weather was very, first of all, we experienced super different kind of weather in just one week. It was super calm at the beginning when people got just adjusted for this uh, environment and so. And, uh, and then it was uh, at some part, it, it got a bit stronger and challenging. And then people could to a bit test their limits. How about seasickness? How about being afraid and so on? And then when people were exhausted, then again, we had a very nice weather. So it was really well planned from, from the nature's perspective. And, and it helped a lot in the processes in the team because this is one more lesson learned. Um, so yeah, you always need to be ready for unexpected things and a different weather condition because also from group processes um, perspective you can of course think of the third days and 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 critical days and and you know all the flow but the weather will also impact it and the weather will impact uh, in general how the mood is what we are ready for but of course with your actions you can also impact the things um, how it goes and how do we deal with all these challenges and that is something um, that um, that sailing offers and of course from logistics side if you can see in the map how many places where we stop and in each place we need to think of the showers because on the ships there are no showers uh, it's usually in marinas that we use it's like a camping on the sea you know like uh, it's just that you are not sleeping in a tent you are sleeping on a boat and you are you can change the uh, location not by walking or running but by being on the boat and and, and trimming the sails but yeah, so in each of the places um, you need to check, you need to call, you need to make sure that we have place, that we have facilities and we maybe in case of rain, we have a place because this project we did again with two boats and it also impacts 
that not always two boats are going on the same speed. So basically there were two teams uh, uh, in the sea and then we were together as one group when we were on the land and together, yes, so it was 12 and 12. So uh, it also impacts a bit how the life and, and how group dynamics develop because part of the project time you, you are spending in one smaller group and then you on the coast, we are doing things together and mixing and so on. So for example, for these uh, uh, practices uh, with uh, yeah, a group of young people, to introduce them sail training. Uh, we did mixed groups internationally from different boats. So it also gave some, some kind of extra challenges. So yes, this was, um, I would say this was a really good project. No, I'm remembering <laughs> it was nice and amazing. And we also did this, um, this project. And these pictures are from the last activity, like evaluation, when people will, were drawing um, what sailing is for them now and uh, there were very different nice stories yes and now this then uh, and then we decided okay it's nice to do a youth youth workers mobilities but maybe we need to go a bit further and uh, to do some uh, strategic partnership because we we understood that there is much more to develop and this is what we did uh, um, uh, previously so Sail Deeper is um, uh, Sail Deeper was a project, strategic partnership project in the field of youth between three sail training organizations, where you can uh, you can see these three ships in a in a in a little corner. So it was Finnish ship, Spanish ship, and 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 Latvian ship. So basically, what we did um, understand. We understood that uh, Latvians want to experience more tall ship experience because we don't have them and we want to know how is it. And, uh, and, and, and so on also just to know, just to sail on different ships gives you a good material to improve your own programs. And not just to see them, to visit them, but actually sail on them because no presentation can explain you how they actually are working. Because for example, also I was, um, I did not, I did not include it here because um, that's not uh, one of the projects I did. But I, I was also sailing in Australia with one ship, which is dev uh, offering uh, sail training for teenagers. Like they are working a lot with uh, with students. And what I've heard that in Australia, well, sail training is super developed. They work with young people a lot. And what I do, and when I heard this, I said, guys, you are totally mental because never ever I could imagine how does it work? Because they, what I do, they spend one week with young kids who have uh, they are teaching them to sail, who have never sailed before. And at the very last day of only one week, they are doing something called um, day of command when they give all the big ship to in the hands of young people and I was like are you really crazy who is doing this this is not safe at all but of course until I did not see how does it actually work I I couldn't actually imagine now I can imagine I can assure you everything is safe and it's it sounds a bit crazy but but everything is safe and controlled but still it gives so huge empowerment to young people because they have this uh, feeling and uh, yeah practically they are managing ship for several hours and a big ship and and they haven't been on board they don't have any qualifications and so on but when I saw in close up like in practice how was it everything was organized how they were building up the skills during the week how they were giving some little cheat sheets of different sailing maneuvers how they were um, organizing this democratic voting after this one week who would like you who you would like to to be the captain who will be sail masters who will be watch leaders so it was super um, and then at the end of the week in a very not very busy place in the sea for cer a certain amount of time like four hours and so like kids uh, kids were able to sail the ship themselves but of course uh, all the crew watch leaders were were around were helping were supporting but the main like responsibility was given to young kids and I was like wow this is super empowering and this is really kind of working even that was a bit of simulation but because the crew was always there but they were not touching the lines they were not doing the things everything was done by young people 
So, and this was super important for us to see how other ships are working because also, for example, Helena in um, Finland, they are uh, uh, famous with social inclusion projects. They are working with uh, young people from very different um, challenging backgrounds, including also with some disabilities or as the hearing disabilities and visibility like, and, uh, and I was like, how is this even possible? How can this be safe if you are inviting people without sailing experience who cannot hear, who cannot see? And so we were very curious to know what the are they practices, how do they work with them? How do they train them and so on? And uh, yeah, and that's why this project happened. It had several phases of international, of course, uh, mobilities and meetings and trainings together. But then we also understood that we want to create something inside this project. And um, we had one very common uh, problem. Uh, we did have, we, uh, sailing is seasonal. And that means during the winter, everything goes quiet. You know, when the season ends, when the ships are put out of the sea, the season ends. And this is the moment when we are losing our team members somehow, and also young people, because they, they need to wait for the spring, you know, when everything will happen again and we will get involved. And then, um, and then we understood we need to create something for winter time. And this was what we did in this project. Um, and we, in, uh, we were inspired by uh, Finnish uh, partners and uh, who are doing this Sea Tribe project with the social inclusion um, uh, kids. And we said, no, we should do something similar, but a bit different. Of course, we didn't want to copy. And so we, you know, we developed a, a program for winter, which was called Wind Tribe. And um, I'll get back to this. Yeah, Wind Tribe. So basically, we were organizing different um, uh, workshops connecting to wind, like topics, uh, something to wind and sailing and then sail training. and. Um, and we were organizing for local young people. So we, and also we worked with some uh, organization who is, uh, which is involved uh, working directly with the young people from social, um, uh, social services. And, uh, and so, and that's, uh, that was uh, one of them. Um, yeah, so that was one of, one of oh, I see there is something in chat. Okay, there is a, Okay, thank you, Vera. See you. Mm -hmm. On the way, I facilitated the briefings. Okay, so with the briefings in sailing. So yes, and um, and um, yeah. So basically, this was um, so this uh, this was um, uh, another tool how to keep the contact and involve uh, the sailing community as well, so they also don't get uh, then lose in touch. So yes, that was um, sail deeper project about. And, uh, and yeah, and if you talk about, again, international exchange, then uh, you can see how the program looks like on a sailing ship uh, where we have actual practical sailing on uh, that specific uh, ship. And we have a lot of different discussions regarding, um, regarding uh, content, about non-formal education on board, about uh, adjusting different methods and so on and um, and uh, about the role of uh, watch leaders and, and and so and also this practical and maybe i will uh, already uh, so she left but um, but uh, answering the question about the briefing uh, on on board is um, well i wouldn't say i do it different differently than i do it on on land uh, i i do we do briefings after a certain sailing experiences, certain uh, activities, or maybe some safety drills, what we are doing. And then, uh, and then of course, it uh, depends on the specific content. What we do is um, we, we do focus both on technical and non-technical or soft skills. And, uh, and that is something what is super important because not always and not with all crew, you develop this um, safe atmosphere that you can share, you can be, and you can learn. And, and these are the topics what we really need to sometimes work through. And when, what I have experienced that super, super important is for a project like this, uh, 
um, that the person, uh, usually it works like that. I work more like a facilitator and also the person who keeps all the program together. And then there is skipper and officers uh, who are focusing more on the sailing part. And, and so, and then in my experience is that uh, sometimes we go very much hand in hand. We understand each other very well. We trust a lot each other. And so we know our uh, kind of divided tasks. But on the same time, there is a lot of trust also to each other how to do things. And we are uh, on, the, yeah, on different principles, so not on different, but on the same principles, how we approach it. And then you can see how the program goes very smoothly, how the atmosphere becomes super open. People are reflecting on stuff, uh, even how the different deep discussions happen in the small groups and big groups and so on. Unfortunately, not always you are so lucky to sail with such a um, skipper. Uh, and sometimes you need to, uh, first you need to do sometimes some educational work. Sometimes you really need to kind of adjust how you do it. And sometimes it's super divided. And sometimes skippers are the ones who, who think their work is to deliver safely from A to B. But the rest, what you do, doesn't matter. That's up to you. And this, I personally don't like to work in such settings because it's it's really hard. And it also gives a bit of a vibe into the all the crew, how things are happening. So that's why I'm trying to work as much as possible with, with captains to actually make them aware of what we are doing here and uh, in non-form education and how that can give an added value for uh, sail training practices, how that can give this learning a much, much deeper value. And, um, and yeah, so that's, um, and I have found some of them are really amazing and I have been lucky, but some of them maybe are not for such type of trainings and, and different learning uh, experiences. So yes, but that's uh, that's how how I uh, how I do. So yes, this was one of. And if you want to see, I don't think you will see anything new in these videos. But we took some very old, nice, new, known, uh, well known uh, methods and adapted a bit to the ships and giving this video and created some um, videos for the for the ones who are working on ships with sail training, saying okay. You have 21 different methods you can actually use with your young people on board when you maybe you don't know how to work and so in different like how to get to know each other, how to actually use for facilitating, how to support learning, even if it's about sailing and so and also how to evaluate how to how to debrief and I would say I use most of the debriefing methods I use on um, on the coast as well. So that's, uh, I don't think there is a huge difference into that. Maybe just a bit uh, topic changes. Yes, and I mentioned the Sea Tribe, uh, the Sea Tribe as inspiration for Winds Tribe. What we did, we brought uh, two, no, one group. We wanted to bring two groups, but then COVID came. Uh, we brought a group of young people. Some of them never been abroad. Uh, we brought them to Tenerife to sail. And then COVID hit us and um, we got a bit stuck. That's another story for another topic, I guess. But uh, still, after all this crazy experience, they said it was worth it. And we love that because for them was they could not ever imagine that they would do. And this was interesting. What we did, we did uh, make kind of two training programs together. We half of the group were young, uh, young new watch leaders, let's say, and young watch leaders. And half of the group were young people uh, from different backgrounds. And we did kind of two parallel trainings because we did training for watch leaders in practice. So they were actually working with these young people. But on the same time, they have their own learning practice. So we reflected every evening about how the day was going, about how do they do all these things, uh, what activities, about the methods, about technical stuff. So it was like two parallel lines of doing. And I think that was, um, it was a bit ex an experiment we did, but I think it was also great because then uh, these young people got a very personal approach in sail training because there were six watch leaders and six uh, young people. 
and uh, combined with um, with this so everyone was um, kind of happy about all this experience but because in practically what we did we just did a normal sailing trip you know in an in in place but if we go deeper there were two different levels it was about practicing social inclusion on the ship and developing your watch leader skills as well so so it was a mixture of practical sailing and uh, non-formal education workshops uh, and then reflecting on meta level after all these days and uh, the evenings only for watch leaders while young people were together with youth worker were cooking or, or doing some games and so on. So it was super intense week, but I think it was very good because otherwise, if you are not in touch with your direct target group, what you are learning about, you can make a very nice theoretical conclusions but it's not really like that you cannot you can you cannot put them in practice like right now tomorrow okay i have this insight and then tomorrow i go and i practice and i try it out and and see how it goes so yeah this was a nice um uh kind of ending because these young people who were coming for different events uh connecting to the wind topic um and then uh, the most active ones got the trip to tenerife which was amazing Yes, and this local one, I think I already mentioned about one day sale training for first timers um, from Riga, just to get a taste and then they become super active. And here comes my some of my conclusions and maybe we can uh, dig a bit deeper again <laughs> back to the topic is ship a disturbing or encouraging learning environment, which I got in this uh, 2012 when I started with this youth exchange which didn't end well maybe not at least not the way i was expecting um i was thinking and comparing um, i think that um, there are different advantage advantages and disadvantages and i mentioned why i love this environment at the very beginning but if we put kind of in a in a table then and compare different criteria, then um, maybe you can get a wider picture. Uh, first, I think it is about space, like physical space. How big is it? Uh, on land, we can wish for, sometimes we don't get it, but there are more possibilities to really get much bigger space. Uh, and then think of different crazy exercises, you know, uh, like, um, yeah, where we need some space. At sea, we have a limited space and it's moving. And that you need to take in account, thinking of what is uh, or not possible. Even for example, on Attila and Helena, they even have a TV screens with the, you can make presentations on there. Like, you know, there is a big uh, place where to gather, but more like around the table, not like, you know, you don't put chairs in a circle. There is some fixed places you can sit or maybe you just sit on the deck and so on. Also, there is uh, an ongoing, um, ongoing some sailing duties if you are on the sea. But uh, what I was telling you as well before that uh, I start to limit a bit practical sailing parts, but kind of mix them. And then, of course, you can also go on shore and marina or outdoor and so on. So it's a bit mixed and, and sailing part is uh, something special, something you prepare to, something you reflect to. It's not just like a normal everyday duty because for the people who are coming, especially first time, it's not like everyday normal thing. For them, it's something new. You They need to figure out things and so on. And then if you want to put you know, another layer of a lot of <laughs> content and information, then it's not always end up uh, as very much of learning. It's more like overwhelming and, and, and so. So yeah, that is, but, uh, but still these things, um, um, how to say, these, are, they, these things are possible. Like you can still do group works. You can still uh, deliver information. You can still even do some movements on a bigger ship. So we did uh, some impro uh, sessions uh, on a ship. We did some like, yeah, different stuff. Um, the next one I want to emphasize is emotions. And uh, comparing to my experience working on land and working at sea, uh, this is a, like a totally like big, big difference, like huge difference. Um, like, of course, uh, 
you can there are emotions in different activity re reacting to different processes and activities but i would say the scale of strongness um, the strength oh yeah the scale is much much bigger and sometimes at the sea you don't even need so much uh, you don't need to do like um, for me ship it's uh, herself is a tool for learning as uh, sometimes you don't need to do anything things start to happen themselves and this then plus you can add you can guide you can a bit bring some things more on the table some less but in general uh, it is um the environment itself somehow is already provoking different stuff in people and getting out of the comfort zone, it happens like this. It's you don't need to put any extra challenges and things. Uh, um, so on land, sometimes yeah, you think of all oh, about this topic should be do like, but on land, I mean uh, by this one, I don't mean on land like in a forest and and an outdoor somewhere else. I more think of this traditional uh, conference room. Maybe I should have specified that because I'm not saying that you cannot do the same in forest or or somewhere like that, but more on land. Okay, I should correct that and say in the room in a conference room. Um, yeah, so. Um, so yeah, at sea, maybe it's even more, uh, mm, we need to be more aware of how not to bring people too far out of comfort zone. And this is something what we also they talk and discuss about, yeah, about uh, comfort challenge, panic zones, about science, how to help people, because uh, it can happen very easily, especially with seasickness, that people are totally in discomfort and, and um, and dealing with self with themselves very hardly, but uh, but that's also part of the learning what we what we can do. And uh, yeah, about connections and sense of belonging. Uh, to be honest, sometimes it feels that um, with people who are I am in the sea for a week, I talk much more than with some friends that I know for a year. You know, like uh, that thing, that level of intensity because and also sharing space and also um, developing your uh, concept of where is how much personal space do I need and um, and and what happens when it limits uh, that also gives a bit of um, of uh, yeah a lot of material for reflections and and so and uh, yeah and I would say that it really depends on the crew on the certain trips but um, it's usually that the people uh, kind of find their uh, place uh, in the group uh, much uh, much uh, like yeah stronger sooner and so on but of course depends it doesn't mean that all the crew teams are always super happy and that's it and so and yeah and responsibility level in the sea is quite high um there are certain uh, no one is asking for from anyone to do anything they are not able to do but at the same time, the things that uh, they are asking are important and should be done. And this is also yeah, about how to develop and train your responsibility level and, and, uh, and yeah, also another material to reflect them. And as I mentioned before, trainer and scripper are the ones who set the tone and sometimes, unfortunately, skipper or captain even more. And trainer is just... Uh, helping hand for this or maybe suggestions but uh, legally as well uh, captain is responsible for what is happening on the ship and uh, all the yeah so that's why there is this authority certain certain in a certain way but that doesn't mean that there is no space for democracy even i know that some ships are quite out, out or, how you call this Autor authority <laughs> Oh my God, I've, I've lost all the words already. Authoritarian, so, I guess. Yes, thank you so much. So they are like more like, like I would as sometimes uh, my uh, friend who is who is quite democratic uh, captain, he's joking that ship is dictatorship. <laughs> like, but he's talking about the ship herself more than I would say. Of course, there is certain hierarchy, but we need to follow. But then there are more like, you know, military ships who are super strict and, and so, and then there are sail training ships who, which are like depending on, the, on, on, on certain organization, but even more on the skipper, there could be very different levels of, um, 
and, and, and democracy. Of course, there's not going to be democracy about safety issues, that's for sure. But the rest, what is happening, how is happening, how we're living together, how we are sharing. And so, but democracy comes with responsibility, right? And actually, maybe that, yeah, that's also a good, is a good place to, to see this, uh, this balance between that as well. Yeah, reflecting not only on some stories, but on real life situations on that ship. Yes, and the last thing what I wanted to show you, and maybe you are curious and how to actually get into that uh, a part of organizing youth exchanges when you don't have any ideas what you're doing, and then developing your skills. Uh, we also, yeah, once we understood we have solved one of our problem to, in, to attract young people and to involve young people, then we started to have another problem that we don't have actually enough skilled sailors to uh, who can be involved together with uh, skippers uh, or captains um, to train young people because you know captain okay captain is responsible for everything what's happening but captain doesn't have to be the one who is showing you how to tie a knot or showing explaining you how the toilet work you know there are different levels of trainings or the one who maybe can facilitate a workshop and or get to know each other or um, to, uh, discuss on different topics or, and also captain needs some helps uh, helpers who are uh, managing the ship when he is sleeping, especially when we are going uh, on a longer trips. There is no captain. I haven't seen any captain who can live without sleep for seven days and be just ir ir like <laughs> irreplaceable. Of course, uh, we need some extra hands. And so and this is the reason why we did the last project, which is called Watch Leaders for Better Sail Training and also giving a bit of uh, insight of how do you actually become one, a part of um, finding your own ways. So again, uh, we had this, the, we continued the collaboration of, between STA Latvia, Snoopu and Attila, these three organizations. And now you can see the, the beautiful ships they have. So there is this Helena I was talking about, Attila. Attila looks like a pirate ship totally, and that's different <laughs> feeling on board. And also two boats, um, Vagina and Spaniel. So this, um, so these organizations who are which are operating these boats, we came together and we started to do a nice project. It started when COVID started, so we had a COVID challenge. Mm, so if you cannot go outside, go inside. We decided to go inside in our organizations to make kind of to analyze, to understand how we are doing, what we are doing, compared between organizations to see what are the best practices and so on. And also we wanted, you know, not to go alone, but to go together so we can go hard and, and to deliver something that is useful for also the field and, and so on. And of course, joint resources plus EU funding is amazing way how to do it. And uh, and yeah, to find a con common solution. So the the focus in this project, the focus was these sail trainers. How to prepare sail trainers on local level, on international level. So we actually need them, and and we are not the only ships that sometimes we don't have them enough because there's always young people who want to come and join and sail now. But um, but we always need also hands that can actually do the job. That everything happens. Uh, smoothly and safely and also it's super super interesting to find out how others do the same thing because then you can find out why you are doing the way you are doing and maybe there is something that can be changed and uh, yeah so basically we decided that we want to learn from each other even more but more not just on how to work with young people but how now focusing on on actually inside resources and, and also to give some base for this international network of cross-ship trained human resources, because sometimes it may happen that one ship needs extra hands and so on, and we can actually use some common pool of um, international say sail trainers. So that's like more vision for the future. We are not there yet, but at least this, uh, these people who were involved, they have experienced different ships. So yes. <laughs> This one about challenges I, I mentioned, but what we what we actually did, we did again uh, international trainings on different ships, but now focusing on watch leader training. 
designing watch leader training and, uh, and delivering watch leader training on different ships. So now you can see me in action as coach and board. This is a whiteboard where all the information is announced every day on this uh, ship. And um, so, yeah, that was, um, that was more about um, how they prepare for the season. And the good thing was that on uh, this ship, Attila, they started the season and after COVID, after two years of break, they said, oh, we are so rusty. We don't even know how to do it. And this project came right into time so we can get back on track and actually refresh all the knowledge and skills and maybe even bring them on another level. Yes, so, and this is how the watch schedule and also training schedule look like. Again, you see the light blue are the uh, sailing parts. We did not sail that much. We spend a lot of time uh, in discussions and also preparing to sail because that's a huge part. Like this uh, dark blue parts is when the sail training on that specific ship was delivered to get to know how this specific system work, how this uh, and so on. And then of course, on top of that, um, different things about the development of programs and organizations. Then we had amazing uh, trip in, um, in Finland, but then this time the schedule was more like open agenda. We came together, we put all the topics because it was more like midterm evaluation for the project. And we were on some, uh, some path to develop local watch leader programs for specific ships, but also integrate them in this, in, uh, into these programs, also integrating international uh, trainings. So basically you missed this opportunity already. <laughs> so you could become a, a sailing youth worker or sail trainer or watch leader. But actually in this, uh, in this project, we involved only people who have sailing experience. So we didn't start from the scratch. We started more working with the sailors and giving them uh, opportunity to develop both technical and soft skills, um, how to work with other crew. And this was fun. Uh, we were navigating without electronic devices. We switched them off. They were using paper maps to navigate in Finnish archipelago, which is like a computer game because you really need to follow all the, all the signs in the water. So it's kind of fun, but super, super respon high responsibility. And then as well, the last one, well, not the last one, but the biggest one was again on Helena ship. So it was more about also planning um, and uh, yeah, ex exchanging skills and, um, and, uh, and planning the next steps. And we concluded this international training um, uh, series, which we did for in this year because nothing could happen last year. So it was a bit of intense because of COVID. But what we did on Spaniel, um, that was the last kind of evaluation and closing. We did uh, we did practice several um, uh, several tools. What we now are using very actively for watch leader trainings, and these are first of all we developed some uh, self self direct learning checkbook uh, checklist first for trainers to kind of guide a bit to different uh, content, but also uh, for, training, uh, for trainers and skippers, but also for trainees to give a bit responsibility of learning for themselves. You know, that they are not just sitting and waiting, okay, you will need to teach me this and this, but they really can go through and think of what they want to learn, how they want to learn. And there are 12 different thematic blocks marked in different colors. And also according to three different levels of, uh, of knowledge and skills. It's for beginners, for sailors, for watch leaders. And, uh, and uh, it looks more or less like this. It's still in the last uh, production phase and some feedback was given and so on. So basically, if you start sailing and, and sometimes it's like you start sailing, you, you learn two knots and maybe some basics and you think, oh, I know everything. But, but you don't know what you don't know yet. And this gives you a bit of um, realistic um, overview of uh, what uh, has to be done. Uh, these lists are more connected to the practical uh, and, uh, and the yeah, technical things, but, the process, but, the, but not only. 
but the process it's more yeah about how the shape is organized and so on but uh, and how the processes and different positions and different maneuvers are happening but the process is very yeah so they're self-directed so it's like a mutual like both sides have responsibility for learning but and you can follow your own progress. On the other hand, if you feel like, oh, I don't know anything, I'm just sailing, but I haven't learned. If you go through the list and you have been on the ships, you will notice that you have actually learned quite a lot, but maybe you haven't brought it to the awareness level. So yeah, so that was the product in Latvia, what the checklist, what we developed. And uh, if you want, I can send you a copy afterwards. Uh, not yet when it will be already in English because now the draft is in Latvian still and the project is not over. But uh, yeah, so basically maybe you have already some uh, some skills and so. And Finnish colleagues did exactly, um, not exactly, almost the same. So they have their own list and own, uh, their own structure. But what they did, they actually added, um, uh, because they had this issue of, um, you know, how to become from below the deck, when you are organizing everything, how to become a deckhand, a helpful, like, you know, deckhand watch leader. So they made uh, this list for transition, you know, one step, one stage forward from below the deck when you organize food and, and other living conditions and so uh, to the one who can actually help to sail. And they have the list. The only difference, a part of design, is that they also ask a skipper to sign it so someone if you have learned this then you need to kind of prove and it is approved by skipper in our list uh, we do not uh, yet at least uh, ask for uh, you know teacher says what is your mark no it's more like a guidance you can use it you can skip it you can also continue sailing without it uh, but it, this is more for the optional for the ones who really want to uh, learn quicker, uh, more in more, more structured way, and so on. And then, of course, some tutorial videos will, will follow. I'm really looking forward to see the one with the life raft, because it doesn't happen often when you actually make one to float and, and open, because usually that's quite expensive stuff to do. And, and yeah, so here are these um, videos about safety equipment, fire safety, first aid, abandoning the ships, all these things, you know, regarding safety, what you, Rodrigo, were of, uh, afraid of. Uh, so these are going to be very uh, clear, um, uh, uh, yeah, instruction videos. And the same as well on Attila, uh, they were the only ones from our partners who actually had written training manual for watch leaders, what they need to know and learn when they come on board and join as volunteers, because they have this um, watch leader volunteer program on board. But the thing was that this information not always really sticks with you and you and because it's a lot. And also their written word is a written word. So they finally now are making certain instruction videos for watch leaders to, to set the to set the skill set to set the content what they are expected actually to do because they are uh, if span like uh, sta latvia and snoopu they are more like locally based and they work with the non-national level and or local level i mean the crew is mostly Finns or latvians the Natila is super international. You can end up with the crew from eight different nationalities, like really people coming from all over the world. And this is a big challenge if you want to prepare them to on a certain standard that um, they are able to perform. Most of them, of course, they have sailing experience, but on different ships with different maybe systems. And then once they get to know and they have a crew training usually in spring, for three days, but it's usually not enough, and you know it's not really much time to do that. So, so now they are developing this kind of um, uh, this kind of um, um, uh, materials. And if you are interested to do something like that, then um, I'm just imagine the best, uh, easiest way is uh, to apply for um, Attila as coach on board because this is your strength. Uh, to be someone who can facilitate processes on the group dynamics uh, it's uh, it's very it's like um, how to say yeah the things what you you are usually doing as a trainer and then to experience ship and to see um, if you want to actually go also into sail training as such because for coach on board it's not as 
uh, they don't ask anything regarding sailing experience. It's good that you have one. It's good that you have, you know, what happens with you when you are in a ship. It's good that you, you know, aware you are able to actually function in a ship and you are not, uh, you're not shocked of conditions and everything. But, um, but they, that is a chance how to get a bit into sailing and to see where it goes. So, and basically that, that means uh, if trainees usually pay a certain amount of money to get involved, I mean, uh, not in these projects, because this was, of course, uh, covered by Erasmus, but in like a normal sailing trip, trainees are, cost are paying money. But if you are a watch leader or a coach on board, it's like, um, it's like a barter. So you give some of your skills and you are on the board and you, well, unfortunately, don't get paid unless you have certifications and you can become an officer. But this is amazing um, experience to have to build up your skills and then to see what what you want to do with that. So basically, yeah, that would be, I would say, the best way to suggest because you already missed this project where you could have been maybe for participants and to get some ideas. Okay, and uh, yeah, and one more thing, what we did at the end of the Subach Leader program uh, for um, sale trainers were two trips. Uh, oh, okay, Rodrigo also has to leave. <laughs> I'm already almost done. <laughs> okay, thanks for joining. Sorry, I have to go. Okay. And, and yeah, so what we did and uh, was uh, two like test trips for watch leaders. So basically they organized 24 sailing trip by themselves, for themselves, organizing everything. So it was a bit higher. It was kind of captain's level, what they were expected to do, but there were on the ship two captains, like professional ones, but they were like invisible. So they just gave the task and were there for safety. So they did not interrupt in any decision-making, in any processes, anything. So basically, they were only observing for 24 hours and also to give also they give some simulation tasks for emergency situations which of course uh, and then they were there just for safety if something goes wrong at any point so so this was super strong and i know that also um, also the british um, uh, sailing uh, uh, sail training companies who are preparing skippers they are doing it uh, in a, like similar approach uh, but uh, but so this was super super um, this responsibility level was super super high but on the same time there was also safety level because there was always backup which but uh, they did not do anything did not uh, interrupt so basically after these 24 hours or 12 hours we did two trips one was on local level another was international one we had a very, very long debriefing. And the briefing was about all these 12 or 24 hours, about everything. And what was important that um, uh, like all the, all the briefing uh, happened first uh, by watch leaders themselves. So we could really discuss and think through what and how and so on. But then only then at the end is, um, or, or maybe, yeah, the professional skippers gave some feedback, gave some, uh, some um, uh, some yeah comments or maybe questions some uh, some situations um, but yeah that the responsibility level was much higher than they actually were asked ask from uh, uh, they are asking for uh, from watch leaders during the trip so so that was a super important and again we did not the, the skippers didn't give any grades the skippers um, just gave some feedback and tips and we were discussing situations, some of the maybe mistakes we already thought through ourselves. But that's super, super, from my experience, I can say that's super, super valuable that there is not this immediate feedback or the briefing after maybe every action. But you really are independent in your process. You can think of, okay, what happened two years, uh, not two, but two years, but two hours ago and so on. And really, really go through all these things and then to get some maybe more professional review. And this is definitely something we will keep um, for, uh, for these local uh, trainings, at least in Latvia. Uh, which we are doing. Um, so yeah, we are in Latvia. We are doing this watch leader training like very regularly with the, with meetings um, once a week, and then different covering different topics. And then this um, 
this is kind of like final test, but not really exam, but just the final test. Yes, and for the ones who have still who are still here, <laughs> I have some final like conclusions or recommendations. The first one is just do it. It's sometimes hard and complicated, but totally worth it just to try. Uh, yeah, to taste it. And you can always uh, contact me and we can find a way uh, I can help you to get on some ship or um, just to to find some opportunity for you. Even uh, at the moment, we don't have any new running projects, um, but uh, uh, the ships are always there and the sea is there. And uh, yes, um, and to be honest, trainers who are comfortable and skilled in both sailing and non-formal non education are super rare to find. I think that is the field where I would love to see some uh, colleagues of mine doing the same thing and we can do something together. And But there is no formal way to become one. That's true. That's uh, There are different opportunities, but you still need to build up your way and, and find and, uh, yeah, or just call me if you are interested and so. Uh, yeah, and another thing is also to find a skipper that you are really on the same wave. Um, that's a super valuable thing. It changes basically everything. And I know amazing ships, but not always the skippers are the ones who allow this uh, amazing non-formal learning happen on the ship. That's sometimes said. And I also have stopped some uh, collaborations in past because I felt we can get to certain level, but not really fully. And I didn't feel that the, it is the best that we could deliver. But then are also amazing skippers that um, actually are there sometimes just naturally. The funny thing was like the, my dear friend and, and, and uh, also sailor and skipper from Finland uh, and they they were doing actually the things what we call, you know, non-form education approach and everything, but they were not really paying attention what they are doing. And we kind of through our projects, we brought their awareness that what they are doing and how, and there's actually a theory, theoretical background and so on. They were really happy. Oh yeah, maybe we should be maybe more aware. So sometimes it just happens because even they don't understand what you're talking about. At the end, it seems you are actually doing the same thing. And so, yes. And about the briefings, I don't know how to comment and what to say again, how we do it. Uh, we try to do it uh, well, <laughs> deep and, and uh, because there's always material to the brief, that is for sure. And, uh, and that's, um, yeah, and the different tools that uh, really help. And, uh, and also, yeah, it helps a lot for yourself to, uh, to develop at the sea as a trainer, as a human being, as a team worker, a team member. So, um, yeah, not only as a sailor in, in general. So I always learn something new about me. That's super like the place where I don't get bored. I get bored very easily when I go to another, you know, training on certain topic and so on. But but on the ship, no, there is always new layer, new layer to discover. So, so yes, um, so yes, deep ocean gives deep life changing lessons. Um, and I agree that, like, I personally would love that everyone sails, but I understand that sailing is not maybe for everyone, and that's okay. But I think that everyone deserves a chance to try, at least to taste it and not to live. Uh, I know many people who are living for 10 years with this dream, but they never dare and they may never even hope that there is a chance to try out. And then they realize, wow, I love it, but why didn't I try it 10 years ago? And I can say the same because I knew about opportunity at least five years before I actually joined that. And that's, um, that's also a pity somehow. But okay, everyone has their own time to find their ways. And, uh, and yeah, and I would say that sailing is very empowering because if you can sail the ship, you can do everything. I cannot describe this amazing feeling when you are behind the steering wheel of this huge 30 or 70, doesn't matter, but quite many meters, huge uh, ship, and you are steering it, you are working with the sails. And basically that gives you really feeling, wow, I can, I can do things. And it doesn't matter how physically fit you are. It doesn't matter uh, no, also knowledge level because you can still learn and so on. So yeah, so what, what can sailing be for you? 
it can be a community to belong to. And now I get back to these young people who are still in the team and I, I see they really feel uh, and see the value of there is this international sailing community, there is national sailing community, there is organization uh, community. And it, this, um, I'd say this community feeling is much stronger, I would say, than in some other places, um, that some other communities somehow. Uh, this is also greener traveling and living opportunity. Some people move on the ships to live, like that's more extreme. But uh, but to be honest, uh, only especially especially sailing made me more aware of different um, the limited resources we have on the planet. Also, when you go sailing, you need to think: what do you need? What are the basic needs? So. It doesn't, you know, have a lecture of uh, how we should be aware of different uh, resources, but it just happens naturally. You just pick, start to use less resources and be more aware of uh, how much you buy and how much you um, consume and so on. Um, it can also be mission to save the planet. There are some amazing organizations, some of them a bit extreme maybe on the edge, uh, like Sea Shepherds, they're really like saving our planet by interrupting with them um, with some um, illegal uh, fishermen and so on and just to and bringing uh, also Greenpeace making campaigns of being aware of what is happening actually in the sea and so that's another way how to how to see it of course racing for the ones who are super competitive who like you know fast and and focused you can develop your sharp mind and strong body and yeah, and for someone, maybe it's a starting point for a career path in the marine industry. That's also a field to develop that can be a profession. And yeah, mine is maybe the last one. It's a lifestyle and combined with some, some professional elements. And so, yes, so that was my very long presentation. <laughs> we lost people on the way, <laughs> which is sad, but okay, it's, um, it is recorded. And uh, yeah, so these are my contacts.